Thank you so much, Jeremy. Well, I'm thankful for all that God has done in the past couple of weeks, and I hope you are. And I want to get some time as, as a family, as a church family. Um, if you'd like to share, uh, maybe a testimony. We have the microphone up here. Is anybody willing to come? Come on up, Brother Jeremy. Walked all the way back, all the way back to the piano. Come on back. If, uh, if you would like to share something, please come on up. Feel free to come on up and sit on the front, front row. And uh, I guess wait for your turn. <laughs> well, Ms. Helton, so I thought it was her. So anyways, well, I thought I'd be first, or Jeremy must beat me. But uh, he said something about being your first track handed out today. Well, uh, you know, you sign up for certain things, and you try to help people out during doing little things. Hey, can you help me out and do this, that, and the other, and rigmarole? And you're like, uh, you know, all right, I'll do it. And some of you say, you don't know what you're signing up for sometimes when you help a friend out. You know, maybe it's moving, or maybe it's sitting through eight hours of some presentation to get two tickets to a show, whatever the case may be. Well, my wife is a fr- has a friend on Facebook, and, and uh, she says, hey, could you help me out? And she was like a little air purifier, and we like things that purify things and, you know, make things smell good. At least she does. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I guess it's me that stinks and she wants to purify. So she signs up for this and I'm like, well, we have no days open. Saturdays I'm gone and, you know, she wants me to be there. And so Sunday we're like, well, if it works out. And so we sat there today at 2 o'clock and some lady came to our house and we sat through what we thought was an hour presentation, came out to be a two to an half hour presentation cut directly into my nap time. Um, I didn't make food because I didn't want the house to be messed and have to clean it up, so I just like went my meal and everything. I'm sitting here. I am struggling. The, light, the struggle is real. I am, I am hungry, and they're trying to sell me this thing, and I'm like, lady, I'm trying to be as kind as I can. We, we talk, and the, th- the funny thing is, throughout the thing, we told them we're teachers at a Christian school, and, and we were talking. It's like, yeah, we like to pray about things, and this is where God's leading us. We're able to kind of give testimony through this whole thing, and probably took longer to do that than it was that. Well, uh, at the end, you know, she's loading up her stuff, and, and Jen's like, get her a track. And so I hand her a track. I said, you know, you do what you got to do. This is what we do. We hand out invitations, and, and I, we handed her invitation to our church and said, hey, we'd love to have you, you know, and no strings attached. You know, you know it's only an hour presentation usually, um, depending on what it is. And so we were able to just kind of through that, you know, God gives opportunity if we ask for it. And that's what we've kind of been doing through this whole thing is asking for opportunities. In the weirdest ways, he will give you an opportunity um, to do that. I have no idea. We're going to hopefully make contact with her in the future um, when we have that kind of money to spend on that kind of thing. Um, (laughs) Which may be when I'm old and gray. I don't know. (laughs) So, uh, But another thing is with uh, Brother, brother, um, what's his name? Farrell. I was going to say Fallon, but Farrell coming through and preaching to the school. It's been a, it's been a long time coming. We have a lot of young people in there that, that are soft-hearted. We have a few that are tough. And, and through the preaching, I, I was so encouraged that he broke a fallow ground, not only in my heart, but in some of the students' hearts. And so hopefully, you know, we can plant some seeds in those, uh, those young people's hearts throughout the Bible class, throughout the chapels, the weird chapels that we're doing. We're doing some, some different things, and we're doing some rally times, kind of shake some stuff up. So I was just very encouraged um, through, through Dr. Dr. Farrell being here and preaching and being able to, you know, again, just, just be that voice outside. You know, sometimes we as Bible teachers or teachers tell them a thousand times you shouldn't do that. But it takes one person to say you shouldn't do that. And they go, oh, yeah, I shouldn't do that. You know, and so we, I've been so encouraged through those three days of preaching and, uh, and we really appreciate you guys um, So praying for the school. Just continue to pray for the young people um, as we go through the chapel messages. And we have some more speakers coming through. But, you know, it's been a great uh, couple of weeks of school. It's been crazy. But, again, just want to thank you, the church, for praying for us, the teachers. All right? Thank you. Uh, I owe the Lord some praise, so I figured I'd just take the opportunity. Um, Many of you know that I work for a company called Transamerica Agency Network, financial company, and uh, back in January, or it's closer to February, long story short, 
felt like God was telling me to leave that company and leave that, um, that, that type of work in general, period. Which was scary because that's what I've done for several years and that's how I've taken care of my family. And, well, you know, the preacher preached this morning by faith, Noah, and I've had a good dose of that reality over the last several months. And what I'll say is I, I quit my job on faith and the only thing I can tell you is that God let me pay tithes tonight because we've made income. We've made income off of something I never dreamed I'd make income off of. Some of you have seen it on Facebook. I've been buying go-karts and selling them. And you think, you think, oh, that's, this, is, <laughs> this is crazy. God has let us pay our bills and then some and pay our tithes and the missions that we have promised. And I walked out of the financial industry back in February and I have a little garage in my front yard selling go-karts and little small engines. So God has taken care of us in such a way, me and Christine don't know where the next paycheck's coming from. We don't know where the next dollar is coming from. But it doesn't matter because I know who owns it all. And he has proven himself again and again and again and has taken care of us abundantly, above what I ever dreamed. I mean, who leaves the financial industry and opens a shop in their front yard selling go-karts, you know? <laughs> but that's what God has had me do, and I, I didn't plan on it. It just kind of happened, and it just it, it, it keeps happening. Um, and I'll say this. We have seen God move in a couple of different ways. We're very grateful for this church. I'm very grateful for the pastor and for the people here and for everyone being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the revival that we had uh, with the gentleman this past week. Um, me and Christine has prayed very hard and felt very burdened that God's been calling us to do something. And that's all I can say is something. We feel like it's something very important. We feel like it's something that will be full-time ministry, but we have no idea what. And Christine said, well, how are we going to go about this? And I said, well, I'm not going anywhere or doing anything until I know 100%. <laughs> it's God's will. And that's kind of the way that I operate. And, or I want to operate anyways. And she said, well, God don't really write it on a billboard for us. <clears throat> that night, some of you kind of noticed probably. What's his name? I forget his name too. The pre Tom Farrell, Brother Farrell. It's unusual altar call. So we, we came down and we were standing beside the pastor. And out of the blue, he asked who is there someone in here that feels like God's called them to do something? You don't know what and you don't know where. And that's, that's the verbiage me and her had used just prior to that. And so she was looking at me and she was about to elbow me. And so <laughs> we raised our hands and he told the pastor to pray for us. And I thought, well, if we were going to deny it, we can't really now because it's kind of out there in the open. We don't know what. And we don't know where. We have a burden, uh, and we have a, a place in mind that we feel like God might be wanting us to go to. But we don't know for sure, so pray for us. Um, but I feel like God, back in January, started working in my heart to get us into the position of where we're at now. And through his blessings, we're debt-free, and we have uh, nothing that would hold us back in the ministry, I guess you'd say. And I don't deserve to be alive. I don't deserve to be saved, much less used of God. But he is gracious and merciful and kind. And every single morning I wake up and his mercies are renewed. And I'm so grateful for all of that. And I'm so grateful that he takes care of us. It changes, it's changed the way I look at living life when I realize that God can take care of me through any avenue he wants to. And Besides that, Lincoln really loves the go-karts, so <laughs> thank you. God bless you. Hello. <laughs> um, I love giving out gospel tracts. It's my life, and I'll tell you why. At the age of 20, I was saved. I never opened a Bible. I never 
knew the Bible was anything but like a good luck charm. And I married a man <laughs> that was running from the Lord. He had been saved at the age of 11 and called at the age of 11. And I had to get saved before my husband could take on that call, Jeremy. And at the age of 33, now that's 13 years into my salvation, I attended a lay witnessing class. It started on a Wednesday night and went through a Sunday. And we were taught how to share our testimony and how to give out gospel tracts. And I can remember a few things. The first person I witnessed to got saved, and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I got scared. I said, what if they don't come to church? You know, what if I never see them again? And Satan worked on me terribly because when you get, I mean, you're out there and you're kind of, you know, scared to death, and the first person you witness to gets saved, and they say yes to everything, and they pray. Well, that was wonderful, but then Satan worked on me. But at the end of that conference, the leader, and it was a lay person, had us draw something that would symbolize what that weekend meant. And I drew my mouth. You wouldn't know it, how backward I was. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I know you wouldn't, <laughs> but I was. I was shy. I was backward. I remember in junior college, in front of six girls, shaking so much I couldn't even read the paper that I was supposed to read. They kind of made fun of me, and I guess that was okay because I deserved it. I was scared, but that weekend, I realized I could talk for Jesus. Now, my husband always carried gospel tracts in his pocket, and everywhere he'd go, he'd either give a gospel tract or lay a gospel tract down. I let him do it, mostly. Hmm. <laughs> And then my life changed. And he wasn't here to do it anymore. And I thought, there's one mantle I can take up for Gene Helton. I can start giving out gospel tracts. And I practiced. I went into the bathroom and looked in the mirror. I checked my smile. I looked at myself eye to eye, and I'd say, here, I have something for you to read. I didn't ask, would you like to read it? Uh-uh. I have something here I want you to read. I was scared to death. I was scared of no. I'm scared not to give out gospel tracts. I've got to do it. And your children can do it. Trevor can do it. Jackie, Thomas, anybody can do it. And what I do, this, I look for these kind of purses. This is too worn. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed about the purse. I'm not, don't worry about it. I've, I've got a purpose for it right here. I keep my gospel tracts. I don't keep them in the car because I'm too forgetful. I don't keep them in my Bible because my Bible isn't with me when I'm talking to somebody. I practice this. Now, don't think I'm crazy. Well, I practice getting out my credit card and a gospel tract at the same time. Then, if you go to Ingalls, you've got to get your Advantage card, your credit card, and the gospel tract at the same time. It can be done. And I've 
Instead of just giving it to the cashier, now I'm giving it to the bag person. I'm putting gospel tracts in the gas pump thingy when you put it back in the gas pump. I'm putting a gospel tract in every stall in the restroom. I'm giving a gospel tract if the Holy Spirit says, give it to that person that's take, taken a smoke break. Give it. There's a few people involved. There's eight of us involved from other churches that give out gospel tract. One lady gives out 60 a week. Another lady gives out 35 a week. If you give out one, it's tremendous. So I just want to say, I think I'm alive today because I give out gospel tracts. When I was five, my appendix ruptured, and I was a month out in the hospital. I shouldn't have lived. When I was seven, I had polio. I really shouldn't have lived. <clears throat> After Jean died, I had a viral fungal pneumonia. I really shouldn't have lived. I had acute sleep apnea. And I'm just telling you, I mean, <laughs> We say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I fear God because he has my heartbeat. And so I cannot not give out gospel tracts. We can do this. I can't wait for each of you to come up here and tell what, who you've given them to. I have got stories upon stories of people who are so glad to get them. And you look back and you see a young man sticking it in his pocket. Or you look back and you see they've got a break and they're reading it. And I just want to tell you, read the gospel tract first. Read it and get used to it. This gospel tract is really great. You can lead somebody to Jesus with this gospel tract. Just open it up and do it. Please. Please do it. You don't know what fun it is. If you're depressed, do it. If you're window shopping, do it. I've heard stories, and I know Pastor Creed has. There was one pastor I read about that literally threw the gospel tracks out his window onto the street. Did you hear that one, Pastor? And somebody picked up a gospel tract and got saved. Now, the statistics back when we were doing that lay witness class was that if you give out 100 gospel tracts, 12 people would be saved. That's not bad, is it? So please do this. You do not know what it will do for you. I'm telling you, it will change your life. Only thing is, don't lay them out in church bathrooms. I get so carried away that I've got to remember, like if I'm in a different church, I want to lay out a gospel track. You don't have to do it there. Well, I don't know. Maybe so. But just get crazy about it. And, and fear the Lord enough to do it. This is your chance to get some things at the judgment seat, like, you know, rewards. Not that we're doing it for that. And by the way, I love the idea of Chick-fil-A and stuff. That makes it fun as well. And it's nothing wrong with making out, giving out gospel tracts fun. Besides, we do like Chick-fil-A. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> I think she came up with our slogan. Oh, you want? Come on up. Um, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but I am very much an introvert with a very vivid imagination and very absent-minded. <laughs> so all of those things together. And, and, you know, I've been blessed for... I don't know how many years, 35 plus years, 
to minister in a Christian school, which means I'm kind of isolated from the world a lot of times. And so, you know, when I go by the grocery store or whatever, I am forgetful. You know, it's like I leave and I was like, oh, I should have given a track. And so God has really been dealing with me about stop making excuses and start looking for opportunities. And it is so hard for me because my vivid imagination, I can just see people yelling at me and screaming at me, you know, and, you know, one of the problems with social media, you see, you know, they ask somebody to wear a mask and the person beats them up. And so um, I'm envisioning that kind of response. And so I have been praying for days that the Lord would help me to be bold. And so, you know, we had to, um, we had to stop by Sam's on the way home today and get a few things. And I, I was praying about it last night. And I was praying about it this morning. Father, help me not to chicken out. And um, so by God's grace, I, was, I got my tracks ready. And uh, when we were walking in, the guy who gave us a basket, I said, oh, he needs one. <laughs> and I said, here, this is for you. And then when I walk in, the, the two men that are standing there to make sure everybody's wearing a mask, um, I was able to give both of them one. I said, I know you guys get yelled at a lot, so I just want you to have a good day, and here's something I want to share with you. And then again, on the way out, you know, the lady who's checking our receipt, and I was able to give one to her. And I know it's only by the grace of God that I can do that, because I will tell you I was terrified, and not one person beat me up or yelled at me or anything. So... <laughs> I just want to share something that's been on my heart. Um, I want to praise the Lord that he's our good shepherd. In John 10, 14, it says that he's the good shepherd and he knows his sheep. And um, these messages that these men have brought that God has used to bring to our church, um, we've been praying for revival. We are seeking revival. And God is ready to give revival when we are open and willing. And God is really stirring, and it's an amazing thing to see. And we are, we are just so excited and so burdened that God use us in this ministry and God use our church in this mission field that we have here. Um, this is a quote I read in my devotions, and I thought it was really something that would be sweet to remember because God knowing us as his sheep, he knows when to correct us. He knows when to... Um, show us different things. He knows when to take care of us and to lead us to gentle waters and green pastures. If we take time to think quietly over the daily dealings of God with us and lovingly watch for every little symptom of God's presence in us and around us, we will soon be astonished at the degree we will discover of his presence and at the perfection with which he weaves things together for our good. And we are just so excited with the way these men have presented leading our families, leading our church into a revival. And um, I pray that we keep the ground that God has stirred up and we continue to be yielded to him. Thank you so much for listening and being yielded to him. Mrs. Washburn, I'm so glad you didn't get beat up either. <clears throat> but I think you could take some of those guys. I've seen them. <clears throat> Open your Bibles, please, to Second Timothy. We're going to go to a we're going to go to a uh, familiar portion of Scripture, and I've got about fifteen to twenty minutes if I'm going to stay uh, right around the area where we usually let out. But uh, we might go a little bit further than that. Uh, but Second uh, Timothy chapter three and verse sixteen. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. What is the first word in that verse? All. Don't you love the word all? All are sinners. We know that. But uh, we love the word all. All, it's very interesting. If you, if you study in, in the Greek text and go back to the Greek text and just understand um, the uh, the grammar behind it, understand what's going. All means all. <laughs> That's basically what it means. Okay, so understand the meaning of all. All means what? All. all. Okay. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, 
and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness. Uh, we are going in one direction tonight, and we're going to end up in Third John. I have three sermons to preach before our missions conference, and I thought, what book can I preach through? Uh, and uh, if I forgot what Third John was about, but I thought, hey, that's a short book. Let me preach through Third John. And so I opened it up, and I said, well, Lord, I don't want to preach through that because you're going to convict me. <laughs> uh, so we're going to preach through Third John, but let's start here. Just this thought of all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Tonight we're going to speak about this thought, the truth and leadership. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We can look at your word. Help us now as we present the truth to you, to our people, Lord. Speak through your truth, through the word of God. And uh, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just the thought that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, we have to understand what that word inspiration means. And we believe in a plenary verbal inspiration. What does that mean? Plenary means all. Verbal, ver the words. And inspired or inspiration means what? God breathed. And so there's a plenary verbal inspiration here. We believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the Word of God. How many brought your Bibles with you? All right, hold them up nice and high. That Bible that you brought with you, that, that, that words that you read, the word that you hide in your heart, inspired Word of God. You say, Pastor Creed, I don't believe the English Bible is the inspired Word of God. Let me ask you something. Do you believe that that is the Word of God? Do you believe the Word of God is inspired? Amen. We have the inspired Word of God. Praise God. We have the inspired Word of God. And I'm thankful for that. A plenary, all, verbal, words, inspired, God breed. What does that word inspired truly mean? Uh, Theonustris is the Greek word that is given to us in, in, in for the word inspiration. What does that mean? Uh, it's, it's, it's God breathed. That's what it means. But how many of you have breathed today? Anybody? Did anybody breathe today? Huh? There's some people, yeah, I, I know my husband breathed. I smelled it. Yeah. You breathe today. How many of you thought about breathing today? Anybody? I mean, you breathe, but did you actually think, okay, in, out, in, out? I mean, do you walk to church or walk to your car go in, out, in, out? I know when I run, I'm like, I got to get it in and I got to get it out. <laughs> well, it's tough. In, out. And we think about, we don't think about breathing, do we? Anybody think about breathing? No, 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 we don't think about breathing. Uh, Miss Barb, you play an instrument over here. What's it called? The French horn. How many of you ever seen Miss Barb play the French horn? Now, I was told tonight that she is not scared to play by herself, okay? She still, still has uh, just, just breathing and, and to breathe out, but she's going to get there. I told her I'm scared if I was the only one over there, but she's, she has more courage than I do. But when she's over there playing the French horn, there's a purposeful breath that comes out of her that she thinks about when she plays. There's a purpose of her breathing into that instrument, and when we think about the inspiration of God and, and how Scripture was written, it wasn't just some breath. It was a purposeful breath that was breathed from God into the penman. There is only one author of the Bible. One author. Who is that author? God. Many penmen. One author. Thank God. For giving us his word. And by the way, we have an accurate Bible. An errant, infallible word of God. Very thankful for that. But we have a Bible that is the authority of our life. How can we trust that this Bible has the authority? We trust the authority because of its divine character. Where do we see his divine character? The divine character of power. It's power in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Some of you can, can quote this, but listen to this verse. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and, ma- and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This Bible, you can take this Bible over to Barnes & Noble. There's no book on the shelf that can, that can match the power of the Word of God. You can take this Bible into the library and set it down on the table. There's no book in that library that can match the power of the Word of God. Why? Because it is the inspired Word of God, and it has the authority over our lives. Divine character of the Bible, its endurance is as a divine uh, character of the Bible, the endurance of the Bible. 1 Peter 1.25, but the Word of the Lord endureth, how long? Forever. Forever. Voltaire said, uh, in 100 years, this Bible is going to be gone. This Bible is going to be obsolete. There's no more Bible in the world in 100 years. Guess what? 20 years after he died, the Gutenberg Press was printing Bibles in his house. Amen. Why is that, Pastor Creed? Because the word of the Lord endureth forever. Thousands and thousands of years, leaders... And Satan himself has been trying to get rid of the Word of God yet. In a small church in Asheville, North Carolina, up on a hill tonight, we're preaching out of the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. And it's here and it's alive today. There's a pandemic going around, what they call a pandemic. But the Bible's still true and authoritative. There's rioters and people breaking windows and tearing down businesses and burning things up and blaming uh, a police officer and blaming the authority. Guess what? We still have a Bible that's true and that's with us and it's being preached today. No matter who gets elected this year, the Bible will still endure. The Bible will still be preached. The Bible will still continue to be our authority. It's endurance But it has divine teaching. Don't you love 2 Timothy 3.14? But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child. Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. We have its divine character, but we have a divine inspiration. One author, that's God. That one author is perfect. That one author is truth. That one author is powerful. And because of the author, we can trust the Word of God. How many of you have ever gone for a book and you searched for a book, not for the title, but for the author because you trusted that author? Anybody? But I want, I want you to know, why can we trust the Bible because of the author? Why can we stand on the Bible? Why can we stand on these words? Because of the author. Why is the Bible the authority of our lives? Because of the author. The one author, and that's God. But then we see the submission of Jesus into the Scriptures. Although the Lord possessed all authority, exercised authority, and, and taught with authority, he appealed to the authority of the Old Testament Scriptures. Isn't that interesting? Jesus Christ himself, as he came in flesh, put himself under the authority of the word of God. Wow. If a perfect being like Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we learned this morning that he called himself by the Son of Man more than anything else. Wasn't that good? And he came to earth and he put himself under the authority of scriptures. In John 5, 45 through 47, we see this. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? And Jesus Christ coming on the authority of scripture. Turn your Bibles to 3 John. 3 John. That was all introduction. There's a reason why that was all introduction because we come to 3 John and there's a letter written by John. In the Gospel of John chapter 17 verse 17 the Bible says sanctify them through thy truth. What is thy truth? 
Thy word is what? Truth. In 3 John, we see a letter written to one man. Isn't that interesting? Timothy was written to a pastor, young pastor. Titus was written to a, a pastor. Many of these uh, uh, letters, or what we call epistles, were written to, um, uh, were written to churches. But this one is unique, and Second John as well. They were written to uh, a person in the church, and 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 we believe that they were written to and about leadership or leaders in the church. And so we have the word of God. We have the truth. There's no denying it's it's an errant, infallible, inspired word of God. And we open up the Third John. Look at verse number one through four. It says the elder. Unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Four times in four verses, the first four verses, the word truth is used. As he begins his letter to Gaius, he gives the truth. He speaks of the truth. He talks about the truth. And as we look at Gaius, we understand, as we study Gaius. Now, understand this. There's the, Gaius, the, the, the name Gaius uh, is in the Bible and other places, but it's not believed to be the same person. So we believe that this is the only time that this person is listed in the Scripture, but, but we can see a little bit about this man through the writing. So let's look at Gaius for just a, sh- a few short minutes tonight. Gaius, number one, was well-loved. John makes it a point, it makes it clear, described this man as well-loved person, and even goes further to say that he loved him in the truth. Look at verse number one. It says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Wouldn't you like that to be said of you? Well, somebody writes you a letter, and it says, Well, you're well, well-loved. People love you. Not only do people love you, but I love you in the truth. And you know you're going to read that letter, right? Boy, this person has invested in me. This person has affection toward me. This person loves me. And Gaius was well loved. And what does it mean that he was well loved? How was he loved? The most people who feel loved will love you back. Now, I believe that the reason that Gaius was well loved was because he loved. I mean, understand that. Uh, do you love, I mean, if the, the people that you love today, that you honestly love, they're loving people, aren't they? Uh, they love you. How many of you love somebody that loves you? Amen. By the way, somebody that loves you is a lot easier to love than someone that doesn't love you. Is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, we're commanded to love everybody, but by him saying you are well-loved, what he's saying is, boy, Gaius, you, you, I can see Gaius as an encourager, as someone that loved, as someone that lifted people up. Boy, Gaius walked in the auditorium. Everybody wanted to talk to him, say hi to him. He is well-loved. Everybody in the church loved Gaius, an encourager. He was positive, a positive man. And Gaius was loved in the truth and in, inside our identity with Christ, a loving bond. When people get mad or upset and choose to, to not get along, they are choosing to live outside the identity in Christ. Think about that with me. Are you thinking with me? When we choose not to love somebody, when we choose uh, to remove our love away from somebody, we are choosing to live outside of our identity in Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, the Bible says, for, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
Your identity is not where you were born. There is neither bond nor free. It's not how much money you have. Your identity is not, not, not in, in your flesh. Your identity, look at what the Bible says, there is neither male or female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Boy, I think Gaius had this pegged. He was loved in Christ. He was loving in Christ. John loved him in Christ. And we should take that and apply that to our life. Why should we love others? Why should we love people in our church, the people that that walk in these doors, the people we serve with? Why should we love each other? Why should we be well-loved and love each other in the truth? Because we all have the same identity. We're in Christ Jesus. There will be a special love for each other. Gaius did not identify in Christ in name only, though. How did this happen? How, how in the world could he be well loved? How in the world could people in this church love him and he love them? Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill me this joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. That's where we want our church. Amen? One accord, one one mind, loving each other, everybody, right? The same goal. How does that happen? Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in, look at this, lowliness of mind. And what does that mean? It means it's not about me. It's not about me. What else does it say? Let each esteem other better than themselves. Wow. Wow. When I think of Gaius, I think of the fact that he probably put others' needs, others' feelings ahead of his. He probably was kind and tenderhearted and forgiving he was loving. Look at First Peter, First Peter chapter one and verse twenty-two. I'll read it to you. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, unfeigned love of the brethren, of the brethren, unfeigned love of the brethren, unbothered, unmessed with, continual love for the brethren. How are we going to reach Asheville together? How are we going to reach the world together? Because we're in Christ. We're together. Gaius prospered spiritually. I love this. Look at verse number two. I I was even thinking about skipping over this verse. But look at it. It says... Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. John says, hey, Gaius, I want you to have good health. But here's what he says. This is interesting. Look at the second part of that verse. He says, even as thy soul prospereth. Here's what he says. John says, Gaius, I wish, I want your physical health to be as good as your spiritual health. Wow. Now what we gather from this verse is that Gaius might have had some physical ailments. Maybe some sickness that he was trying to get over. And John is appealing to those. He's saying, I love you in the truth. Beloved, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest uh, prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. John was telling Gaius in a loving way that I hope your physical health matches your spiritual health. By the way, we will one day all go through physical ailments, won't we? Some of you are going through those right now. I want to give you this truth. Are you ready? You might want to write this down. Our physical well-being should never dictate our spiritual state of mind. 
Our physical well-being should never dictate our spiritual state of mind. But John was saying this. He was saying, you are a spiritual person. You are spiritually healthy. And I just pray that your, your physical health will match your spiritual health. Isn't that good? No, wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be great for somebody to say that about you? Oh, well, you go to the doctor and you go, uh, boy, Doc, how, how, am I, how am I doing? What, what's going on? You know? Uh, you know, I've got these headaches or I've got this and i got that. What do you want? You want answers. And John says, listen, you have to go to the doctor about a spiritual health. And there's no ailments in spiritual. You've got this. You're spiritually healthy. Oh, what a great message that is. What, how encouraging that is. I love Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. You see, he was a rock. When he was healthy, he was spiritual. When he was unhealthy or sickly, he was spiritual. He believed in God, had faith in God, was faithful. No matter what he was going through, he was faithful, spiritual. But as we read down in verse number 3, for I rejoice greatly, when the brethren came and testified, they saw Gaius, and here's what they said. They testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. And he got excited. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. What a great joy that is. He's talking about his spiritual children walking in truth. He was very thankful that, that, that Gaius was walking in truth. Gaius lived the truth. Now, he talked about the Bible. He said, why, why are we talking about the Bible? Four times in John 3, or 3 John, uh, the, 3 John uh, through the, uh, verses 1 through 4, we see truth four times. What is it talking about? The truth that you have in your hands, the inspired, uh, infallible, inerrant truth that we can have every day. We can read the truth. We can memorize the truth. We can understand the truth. We can, we can teach and we can preach the truth. But God didn't give us the truth for just all those. God wants us to live the truth. Did you catch that? Because we can catch ourselves teaching and preaching the truth to others and know what's wrong with them. But we need to make it a point to live our lives according to the truth. And we have the truth. We are not to try and conform the truth to our views, but we must transform ourselves to the truth of the Bible. There was a certain missionary society uh, in order to gain access for a missionary to work in some of the African tribes. Sent down, they sent down trinkets and uh, they uh, bartered with some of the natives and among them was a package of little hand mirrors. And so, like the ladies use those little hand mirrors that they use and look at themselves. And, you know, there was this, a, a tribe that was kind of on the inner side of the jungle that, uh, that had received some of these mirrors. Now, they have never, ever seen themselves in a mirror. Think of that. Others have seen you, but you've never really seen yourself. Now, in this tribe, there was a certain princess there. And everybody told her how beautiful she was, how wonderful she looked, and, and they praised her beauty, and, and here comes this box, and she hears about this, this, this item that, that she can see, finally see her beauty in this mirror. And it arrived. They handed her the mirror, and she went into the room and looked at herself and realized she was ugly. And not just ugly, she was real ugly. She broke the mirror. 
She took the boxes of mirrors and, and told them to get them out of the tribe. She got the missionaries and said, never come back to this tribe again. She said, Pastor, what happened? She didn't like the truth. She didn't like the truth. It is said that a lie told a thousand times is much easier to accept than the truth told once. And we live in an, a world that we can turn our TV on and we can go right around the corner. We can get hit the radio. We can, we can get to a lie easily, can't we? We can flip our Facebook feed on and get a lie real quick. But you want the truth? Go to the Word of God. And we're not just to read, memorize, teach, and preach the truth, just like Gaius. We're to walk it. We're to live it. Not reject it. Thank the Lord for a church leader like Gaius who didn't just read it, act it out. It was a part of him. It became a part of him. The word of God, that the truth was a part of his life. It was all about the truth. And he lived it. What a testimony. Let's pray.